All right, I want to welcome all of you. When we want to start on time, we're going to watch a film, so you won't be listening to me, but I just wanted to introduce it a little bit. This was uh, just a serendipitous occurrence that we were able to bring these next five Wednesday evening films to you. Uh, Martin Dobelmeyer, who was here uh, a couple weeks ago for the Sabbath Festival, uh, said he really enjoyed the Markham Woods congregation and he wanted to make these films available to us because he knew we were interested in making a difference in the world. And this is a series that he did called Prophetic Voices. So what this is leading up to is on April 27, we are going to have a prophecy weekend where we look at how prophecy can actually help us in our lives to give us peace and prosperity and make us uh, positive influences in society, let's say it that way. So this is leading up to that because this is prophetic voices. Now after this film series in the month of March and April, I will actually do a series looking at um, the history of Christian mission in the world and just what is mission and leading up to what we're going to do for mission, our mission in the world, the message I believe God has given us as a church. But we're going to start off with these five films. So tonight it is Howard Thurman. Tomorrow is the beginning of Black History Month here in America. And Howard Thurman is one of the most outstanding uh, figures, but more behind the scenes in the civil rights movement. So I, this is one reason why Martin told me he did this uh, film. And he wanted to highlight him. Now, Martin wanted to join us tonight via Zoom, but he couldn't make it. He's traveling. So we agreed that on the last one, so the last one will be the, his favorite film, if you remember, from the weekend when he was here on Dietrich Bonhoeffer. And he will join us when we uh, show that film. Uh, but tonight we're going to look at Howard Thurman and his life. Uh, but before that, let's just start off with a word of prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you for your blessings to us. Lord, we thank you uh, for making us uh, light and salt for this world. Lord, may your Holy Spirit be here with us and may he bless us and guide us. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. I did want to say one other thing. During these films, uh, you know, these are probably a bit unusual to show at a Wednesday night. A lot of Adventist churches do Bible studies. These aren't Bible studies. And I just want to make sure you understand by showing this, we're, sh we're highlighting people outside of our confession that obviously their theology won't agree with ours in every point. Uh, but I still think it's worth it to at least look at their lives and, and see what we can learn from them and, and what they went through. But I just wanted to make that clear before I get emails of, well, you know, they're not, they don't believe exactly like us. Well, it's true. But if we limited our study in the world to only Adventist people and Adventist literature, we would, we would be pretty much uh, isolated in, in many ways. So... That's the thinking behind this, so we're going to go to the video right now. He was born the grandson of slaves, yet Howard Thurman would become one of the most celebrated religious figures of the 20th century. A spiritual mentor to Martin Luther King Jr. Whether we want it that way or not, we all tied together. And a moral anchor for the civil rights movement. Martin Luther King Jr. would quote Howard Thurman on many, many occasions. I think Howard Thurman, for many leaders in that movement, King included, played the role of pastor. In the 1930s, after an historic meeting with Mahatma Gandhi, Thurman becomes one of the early voices for nonviolent resistance for a people who over centuries experienced unimaginable violence. He helped to establish the philosophical framework of how to struggle. He saw himself as a spiritual activist because he was fundamentally a teacher. He had this combination of, of being kind and being strong, and I think that's a very rare combination. While Sunday morning was often considered the most segregated hour in the week, Thurman helped pioneer a church where people of different races and religions could worship together. He's suspicious of denomination and dogma and creed. He would never identify himself as a theologian because he thought theologians boxed God. 
and he was called a mystic because he believed religious experience was best explored within. Howard Thurman was actually practicing contemplative spirituality before we actually started calling it contemplative spirituality. At his heart, he was a, a nature mystic. Thurman is talking to trees. Trees. <laughs> Yet this mystic was also an outspoken critic of Christianity for its part in the nation's deep racial divides. And he countered with a shocking new work that offered a revolutionary new way of understanding the life of Jesus Christ and how it speaks directly to the oppressed and disinherited. I carry the book with me, Jesus and the Disinherited, every day. And he gives an Africanity to the interpretation of Jesus. He provided a, a spiritual perspective that was empowering. There were people encountering Thurman's work and being shaken at their core. I would have to find out what was the word that the religion of Jesus had to say to the man with his back against the wall. Major funding for this program was provided by Lilly Endowment. You will find true success and happiness if you have only one goal. There really is only one, and that is this, to fulfill the highest, most truthful expression of yourself. Theologian Howard Thurman said it best. He said, don't ask yourself what the world needs. Ask yourself what makes you come alive and then go do that. Because what the world needs is people who have come alive. The 1960s and the civil rights movement is exploding across America. A century after a civil war was fought to end slavery, Deeply rooted segregation and blatant racism are still legal in many parts of the nation. Now they're being met head on. I may be poor, but I am somebody. I may be uneducated, but I am somebody. Jesse Jackson, Martin Luther King Jr., John Lewis, Otis Moss Jr., Vernon Jordan, and other civil rights leaders are convinced the moment for resistance has come. And no matter how they are treated, they are committed to nonviolence. The spirit in man is not easily vanquished. It is fragile and tough. You may fail again and again, and yet something will not let you give up. Something keeps you from accepting no as a final answer. It is this quality that makes for survival of values when the circumstances of one's life are most against decency, goodness, and right. They were given the power and the authority to respond to the realities of injustice in ways that could be true to their faith and in ways that um, did not require them to compromise the integrity of who they were. Many feel it is Howard Thurman, through his insights and early commitment to nonviolence, who evokes a spirit felt across the entire movement. Whether we want it that way or not, we all tied together. Every Negro in America is a little white, and every white man in America is a little Negro. The Negro needs the white man to save him from his fears, and the white man needs the Negro to save him from his guilt. We need each other. People sometimes seem to think that nonviolence was very endemic to the African-American community as a way of life, when in fact it was not. And even Thurman is very clear that nonviolence was a kind of a cultivated experience for most rank and file people, including leadership. I would agree that Howard Thurman was a saint of the movement. He gave us the basis for the march, that we know why we march, the principles upon which we march, how we march, and what we do after the march. He helped to establish 
the philosophical framework for our, of how to struggle. You cannot let the oppressor break your spirit, then make it break your bones or your arms, but not your spirit. That's the stuff of, of Howard Thurman. Dr. King was not completely committed to nonviolence. When I say not committed, he saw it first as a tactic until he was fully converted to it as a lifestyle. And, and my father helped me with that to, to understand that early on, people saw things as a tactic. This is the best way. Dr. King then moves to this is a lifestyle. And that is a direct connection to Thurman's conversion. And here is a nonviolent revolutionary. One of the foundational works for the movement is a book by Thurman, Jesus and the Disinherited. I have been told that Dr. King carried Jesus and the Disinherited with him most of the time when he traveled. It's a book that really describes what it means to be involved in such a struggle as a spiritual matter, as a matter of faith, and not just the effort to change laws for the gaining of civil rights. He says that the African Americans didn't have any rights, just like Jesus, but they could choose to ground themselves in their own inherent dignity and worth. And if one were to choose this, it would have a lot to do with how they would deal with the question of what do you do when your back is against a wall. The paradox is that Thurman, who has wide impact on the movement, is not himself first a social reformer. He's much more a spiritual contemplative, what some would even call a mystic. Howard Thurman is a great example of making the connection between contemplation and social justice. But the mystic himself is not out on the front lines during many of the marches, and for that, he's often criticized. He was the teacher, he was the, the mentor, he was the spiritual sage. He was not the one who was on the front line, but he was the one where people would retreat to uh, to be refilled. They were praying for a great freedom fighter a liberator, one of them said, you know, we thought we had a Moses and we ended up with a mystic. Howard Thurman determined his role as opposed to having people telling him what to do with it, to be independent, to be free, to be available. For Thurman, one of the great tragedies is that too often on both sides of the racial front lines are Christians. Historically, many churches and denominations suffer deep and painful divisions over issues of race. And Sunday morning is often described as the most segregated hour in America. It is one of the great spiritual problems of Christianity in America that it has tolerated such injustices between Negroes and whites. It is for this reason that many people all over the world feel that Christianity is weakest when it is brought face to face with the color bar. The spirituals are a key part of the civil rights movement, and many have their roots in early slave songs. Those songs are now uniting people across generations. Thurman writes one of the first books about the importance of those spirituals for a people who had been reduced to property as slaves. Something had made it possible for the slave cut off from all of his roots to survive, to uh, hold himself in some vast immunity against the violences of his environment. I think spirituals are the most powerful music ever created. Spirituals were the music of resistance in the slave era. There are original spirituals that are sung the way they were sung, but then they retext them, they contextualize them. So you have, ain't gonna let nobody turn me around, but then they put in, ain't gonna let Sheriff Clark turn me around, ain't gonna let your dogs turn me around, ain't gonna let the hoses turn me around, and it gives them 
faith and motivation and courage in a situation that facing dogs and hoses, you, you need the courage if you're gonna do it. Songs like, oh freedom, oh freedom, freedom over me. And before I'll be a slave, I'll be buried in my grave. Wisdom passed down from the slaves, a sense of creating that inner sanctuary, are all part of Howard Thurman, going back to his earliest days. So he's basically saying, don't let other people's violence or degrading words or whatever invade your inner sanctuary. That, that can only happen if you allow that. That's real difficult in, psychologically if, in fact, you've been hearing this over and over again. But he's saying your strength is this connection to the eternal. Howard Thurman grows up at the beginning of the 1900s in Daytona Beach, Florida. It was booming. A railroad had just gone through. The citrus groves were operating, and it became known as a place for oranges. It also became a winter community for wealthy northerners. In Daytona, blacks and whites are nearly equal in population. And while Daytona could be more racially tolerant than other parts of the South, there is still legal segregation and each community knows painfully little about the other. In my kind of Christianity, the ethic, the Christian ethic, was binding on me in relation to other Negroes, other black people. But it had no meaning as far as the white world is concerned. There's just, 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 just nothing. So that, so that they were not a part of my magnetic field of awareness. You could go to the beach during the day you could work there, but at night, you needed to get home. <laughs> when you're going through a period where you have the Ku Klux Klan identifying itself as a Christian organization, and a period in which people are leaving congregations on a Sunday morning to participate in lynchings, where you have Christian clergy and laity who are either refusing to say something about the kind of discrimination and the kind of violence that is occurring, or um, are rather tepid in whatever they have to say. I knew that when my parents took me downtown that I would sit in the back of the bus. I knew that when we got downtown, that if I wanted water, it would be colored water. Or if I wanted to go to the bathroom, that I would go to the colored bathroom. I understood the rules, but also had parents who would say as we sat in the back, because you was having to sit here does not mean that the people sitting up there are better than you. Thurman's father worked on the railroad. It's a good job, but took him away often. Yet it provides a home and a respectable living for the family. Thurman's father dies when Howard was seven, leaving behind Howard and his two sisters. His mother, being a primary provider for the home, worked doing laundry for persons in the community, white persons in the community. But it was Thurman's grandmother, Nancy Ambrose, who has the greatest impact on his life. Born in the 1840s, she spent her first 20 years as a slave on a large Florida plantation. She rarely speaks about those early years, but one story stays with Thurman throughout his life. She said that when she was a young woman on this plantation, once a year, a minister who was a slave on a neighboring plantation was permitted to have a religious service for the slaves. And always, it didn't matter what his subject was, he ended his sermon in the same way. She said he would stand and look at them and he would say, you are not slaves, you are not niggers, you are God's children. So we would all wait for that moment because a faraway look would come in our eyes and, and just a slight stiffening of a spine. And there was a contagion which, which came to us as little children that, uh, 
that the, the, the creator of existence also created me. And therefore, with that sort of backing, I could absorb all the violences of life. She wanted that to be his primary identity, for him to know that first and foremost, he was a holy child of God. Before he uh, learned anything else about himself that people might have said to him as a result of him being a young colored boy in Daytona Beach in the early 1900s. Thurman describes his childhood as being very lonely. He, I think, always found God in nature. He loved the beach. I was a very sensitive child who suffered much from the violence of racial conflict. I found that the more I turned to prayer, to what I discovered in later years to be meditation, the more time I spent alone in the woods or on the beach, the freer became my own spirit, and the more realistic became my ambitions to get an education. In many places, people feel like you experience the presence of God at church. And Howard Thurman did not believe that that was the only place that you could experience God. Behind their home, a mighty oak tree became the young Thurman's companion. I discovered that the oak tree and I had a unique relationship. I could sit with my back against its trunk. I could reach down into the quiet places of my spirit, take out my bruises and my joys, and unfold them. I could talk aloud to the oak tree and know that I was understood. Thurman is talking to trees. Trees! <laughs> Florida in the early 1900s provided almost no options for black students after eighth grade. But Thurman is already beginning to excel. This was part of this early brilliance that Juan sees and an incredible work ethic. Brilliance, yes, but a work ethic. So he graduates being the very first African-American to complete the eighth grade in Daytona schools. And he goes on to Jacksonville to the Florida Baptist Academy. He graduates valedictorian. And as a world war rages in Europe, Thurman writes a personal letter to Mordecai Wyatt Johnson, who will later become both president of Howard University and a mentor for Thurman. There's a piece in this letter that continually um, inspirits me about the life of young people who are committed to service and the importance of mentors who can affirm them. He says, I want to be a minister of the gospel. This is an 18-year-old. I am patriotic. I am willing to fight for democracy. But my friend, Reverend Johnson, my people need me. But he says, please pray for me because almost on every hand, I am discouraged in my choice of ministry. Sometimes I think nobody cares. And uh, he's actually asking Mordecai Wyatt Johnson to become his father. Johnson encourages Thurman to further his studies, and Thurman heads to Morehouse College in Atlanta, Georgia. Morehouse was founded after the Civil War to educate freed slaves. One of Thurman's classmates is Martin Luther King, Sr. Howard Thurman said that when he walked into Sale Hall Chapel in 1919 as a freshman, President John Hope went to the lectern, and the first thing he said was, young gentlemen. Thurman said the words startled the young men because they were not accustomed as members of the disinherited community to being so affirmed, receiving such esteem. And that affirmation, he said, was like pouring iron into their spine. Thurman was not the most attractive guy in the world. He says this in an unpublished manuscript, so I'm not calling him, I think he's beautiful. But he says he, his company was not welcomed by the girls, and the guys didn't choose him for the games when they were playing. At Morehouse, Thurman becomes active in the Young Men's Christian Association, the YMCA, as well as the Fellowship of Reconciliation, 
where he explores ideas of nonviolence. It was how could he as a black man survive in a world of hatred and oppression? Pacifism was a spiritual resource for him to give him the strength not to hate these people, not to fear these people, but to deal with them as equals. Before he leaves Morehouse, he reads every book in the library, again becomes valedictorian, and now sets his sights on ministry at Rochester Theological Seminary in upstate New York. He's one of only two black students accepted each year. I believe Rochester is, is a place where Thurman begins to be aware of how the Christian faith um, is more than the way in which a particular denomination gives expression. And to have a vision of, of who are our sisters and brothers beyond even the Christian family. While studying at Rochester, Thurman receives invitations to speak in white churches, where he's often monitored by the Ku Klux Klan. But he's also doing something more. He's traveling through Rochester late at night. He is teaching black maids and male servants the very things that he's learning in the seminary because he has felt indebted that what he is gaining needs to be available to those who do not have the opportunities to be part of this stimulating experience in which he finds himself. Thurman completes his work at Rochester, but there's one more piece to his education. Thurman stumbles upon a book by a Quaker mystic, Rufus Jones. And not long after, Thurman leaves for Haverford College outside Philadelphia to study under Jones. It would be impossible to discount Rufus Jones' influence on Howard Thurman. I think the Quaker tradition, not only of honoring silence and solitude and interior experience of the divine, but also the recognition of the inner light in everyone and also the emphasis on social justice made that a perfect match for Howard Thurman. In 1926, Howard Thurman marries Katie Kelly. Just a, a young woman who is deeply committed to caring for those who are less fortunate. In October 1927, their daughter Olive is born. But by 1929, tragedy sets in. Katie contracted tuberculosis from her work as a social worker. A year later, Katie dies. Thurman is devastated. He returns to Morehouse College to settle in as a single parent and teacher. In 1932, during the height of the Great Depression, Thurman is teaching at Morehouse College and the all-women sister school, Spellman. He courts a pastor's daughter, Sue Bailey, and they marry. They became a team of equals. She was an intellectual in her own right, deeply spiritual, and an activist. Together, the Thurmans leave for Howard University in Washington, D.C where Thurman will teach theology. Under President Mordecai Wyatt Johnson, Howard University has become one of the nation's premier schools for black students. Howard University in the 30s attracted this amazing array of talent. Ralph Bunch, who was one of Thurman's best friends. Benjamin Mays, another lifelong friend, was teaching there as well. At Howard University, Thurman is working on this question of how to overcome barriers that divide people, barriers of race, barriers of ethnicity, barriers of denominational identity. One of the projects initiated by Thurman is an exchange of Howard University students with students from Vassar College, an elite school for women in Poughkeepsie, New York. He's very interested in these experiments and this very matter of having students to cross boundaries that they would not normally be crossing is Thurman's own way of fighting the status quo and, and his belief that individuals do make a difference. When Thurman is named Dean of Howard's Rankin Chapel, he seizes an opportunity to cross boundaries through creative worship, using experimental forms of music, 
theater and dance. It's an incredible place, and Thurman sees his mission again in this space is to create religious life, which also gives substance to this notion of community. Thurman sees himself as a scientist almost, in a, in a lab coat, you should picture him, experimenting with religious experience and ecclesiology are the ways in which we understand church and worship. Some folks thought it was pagan, but he did it. Thurman can now combine a traditional approach to theological education with his own understanding of the importance of an individual religious experience. The kind of European strand is very strict, strict doctrinal, that in order for you to have access to God, it must come through these very specific steps that you have to accept Christ, uh, you have to be in this church community, you have to accept this doctrine. Here is Thurman, who is influenced by nature. He's talking about the fact that you can encounter God in these different ways and that you must look not only into someone's eyes but into the experiences of other people to witness God working. And that fits with this kind of Southern black tradition. These stories about that you want to connect with God, go, go sit down by the riverside. Dr. Thurman said, you are never under obligation to preach a great sermon, but you are eternally obligated to grapple with great ideas. And if you grapple with great ideas, you might occasionally in a lifetime preach a great sermon. Thurman incorporates silence into his services as he continues to grow in his appreciation for mysticism. So I do think mystical is a troublesome kind of label. What I think it means is a, a person who relies on direct experience of the divine as being central and true and real in ways that institutional reception of the divine um, or even intellectual reception of the divine are inferior by comparison. What are we doing with our lives? What are the motives that order our days. Where are we trying to go? Where is my treasure? This deep voice, and he would, he would take these long pauses and would kind of throw his head back and his eyes would be closed. And, and as, as he made the pause, it would, it would kind of draw you in. The fact that he learned to live from silence, learned to listen, for what he was being called to do was unusual for the time. And oftentimes he was not well received by other black preachers. What do I, I want? What do I want really? But these long periods of silence that suggested this was not a rhetorical question. This was a question for our engagement. It was a question in which Thurman himself was engaged. Crossing the racial and religious divides will now take on a new dimension for Thurman when, in the fall of 1935, he, his wife Sue Bailey, and another couple accept an extraordinary invitation. They travel by ship to the other side of the globe to what is now Sri Lanka, Myanmar, and India. Both the YMCA and the YWCA are very interested in seeing a kind of Negro delegation in India. All the people who'd been there before, missionaries, other people, were all white. And they wanted to find out what was there in our experience in American society that would contribute to, to their whole struggle. The struggle is over British colonial rule that has been in place since 1858, but now its future is being challenged. He was horrified by what he saw. He was appalled by the way he saw Indians being treated. He was horrified by imperialism. He was amazed that such a small group of people in India, you know, and, and it, it's remarkable how small 
the Indian civil service and the soldiers were, were able to keep a country of hundreds of million people under control. Throughout India, millions of people, the poor and often most destitute, came to be known as untouchables. Thurman caught this as a major concern. Not only was a person despised and was aware of being despised, but they had somehow incorporated this into their very identity. And he made a uh, correlation between that and the struggle of African Americans. Sue Bailey is a leading figure for the National YWCA. She takes on a leading role for the visiting delegation. She was one of the most intelligent, graceful people that you're, you're ever gonna meet. She just carried herself with, with such dignity. There, were, there was never any question about him not feeling that she was an equal. Sue Bailey Thurman looked like she was from India. <laughs> she could have easily passed as a woman living in India. She, she lectured on the history of African Americans from slavery to their present context and especially the role of women. Over the next months, Thurman travels hundreds of miles across India and delivers more than 100 talks. More importantly for him, his horizons for religious expression are being opened. In India, everything was foreign and new. The smells, the altars, the flowers, the chanting, all of it was completely outside my universe. I had to find my way to the place where I could stand side by side with a Hindu, a Buddhist, a Muslim, and know that the authenticity of their experience was identical with the essence and authenticity of my own. During one presentation, Thurman is confronted by a lawyer who challenges him in a way he would never forget. The lawyer is shocked that an African-American would come to India, a place colonized by the British, and uh, a person who represents folks who have been former slaves and who are still segregated in the United States of America would come as a representative of Christianity. I suspect he thought Thurman was just, just another missionary, uh, the kinds that had come before who were proselytizing and trying to get Indians to convert to Christianity. And he gets a surprise because Thurman says, boy, I'm not here representing the religion about Jesus. That's the religion that oppressed me and also had a lot to do with the domination and subjugation of your people. The religion of Jesus, though, is a liberating religion. And it's a religion that the oppressed can own because Jesus was oppressed. Good news to the poor. Heal the broken heart to set the captive free. That's the character of the religion. Now, some characters within the religion don't accept the mission statement. They're just using the name of. But the character of the religion is defend the poor, deliver the needy, set the captive free. But an historic encounter is about to unfold as the delegation is invited to meet privately with the man who has become India's most remarkable figure, Mahatma Gandhi. Start myself as a soldier, so a soldier of peace. African Americans from the early 20s were writing about Gandhi, calling him the greatest man in the world, the greatest man of color in the world speculating about how Gandhi's nonviolent crusade could be translated to an American context. He began asking questions, all kinds of questions about Negro life, about democracy in the United States, about education, public education, private education, churches, oh, the whole gamut. And for Thurman, I think there's a profound reverence for Gandhi that here is someone who is leading a movement of social transformation, committed to the philosophy of nonviolence as a spiritual expression. And when Gandhi says to Thurman that it's perhaps through the Negro that nonviolence will be a force for, of transformation for the world, um, I think Thurman received that as a, more than a blessing, but also an obligation. He said, now, just before you go, I want to ask you to do me a favor. 
And he said, will you sing? Were you there when they crucified my Lord? Because, he said, I think that that song, in essence, provides the meeting place where all of the, the, the human suffering and misery is, is touched by something that lifts it and redeems it. And we sang this song. Thurman's earlier notions of nonviolence are given new meaning. He leaves India with a deeper appreciation for the spiritual grounding for any nonviolent movement and a commitment to see it realized for his own people in America. And he came back speaking and talking about the philosophy and the discipline of nonviolence. And he would preach and, 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 and teach at colleges and universities we give these unbelievable lectures. And so it, it did influence Dr. King a great deal. He painted a picture. He made it real. The 1940s, and America is drawn into yet another world war, this time in Europe and the Pacific. The horrible atrocities, as well as the all-out commitment to war, pose a challenge to any notion of nonviolent resistance. Thurman remains a pacifist, but not an absolutist. He is not saying that violence has no role whatsoever in addressing the threats of community or the threats upon an individual. Are there exceptions to a nonviolent response? Um, possibly so. So he's writing letters, especially to African-American military people, men and women, and he's also providing pastoral support. It's a very interesting place, isn't it? In 1944, Thurman receives an invitation to leave Howard University and come with his family to San Francisco, California, to help co-found a pioneering venture, the Fellowship Church for All People. Many believe fellowship is the nation's first intentionally multiracial interfaith church. It is exactly what Thurman has been dreaming about for many years. Whether I'm black, white, Presbyterian, Baptist, Buddhist, Hindu, Muslim, that in the presence of God, all these categories by which we relate to each other fade away. My parents met in the Fellowship Church. I mean, it was intended for people of different cultures and just different denominations to meet, and that's, that is where they met. Fellowship has two well-known at-large members, First Lady Eleanor Roosevelt and Mary McLeod Bethune, who, like Thurman, has roots in Central Florida. You see folks in Native American dress. You see a lot of Filipinos. You certainly see different kind of ethnic groups gather, African Americans among them. I call it a hodgepodge of people. He believed human community flourishes best when the borders are always giving way, when they're always opening to the unknown and the undiscovered brothers and sisters. And that's huge in terms of any kind of global community that admits more people than those who fit strictly in the borders or boundaries of one tradition. When you see these pictures where the children gather and the teachers or instructors are standing above them, they're engaged in intercultural conversations out of their own traditions. They're retreats and they spend time in intercultural exchange, always pushing beyond what Thurman thought were the artificial barriers of race, tradition, ethnicity, heritage. We discovered that experiences of unity among peoples are more important and crucial than all the concepts, prejudices, ideologies, faiths that may divide. Fellowship Church is significant historically in terms of attention it received nationally and internationally as a church that is bearing witness to the possibilities of overcoming the barrier of race. It became a sign, it became a symbol of what is possible. But in 1949, 
as Fellowship is thriving, Thurman releases what becomes his most influential book, Jesus and the Disinherited, a work that connects the life of Jesus directly to the African-American experience. I carried the book with me, Jesus and the Disinherited, every day, just as a reference. Jesus was a Jew, right? That was his first point. Jesus was poor. He was a poor Jew. Jesus was a poor Jew from a minority group, right? And Thurman makes the point that if Jesus were kicked into the dirt by a Roman soldier, he would be just another Jew in a ditch. At that point, wow, <laughs> he's human. And, and what Thurman is very subtly doing is he's connecting Jesus' experience to the lives of other poor people, to the lives of other minority uh, groups, to the lives of other people who think and believe differently. There's this view that, that Christianity is completely beholden to, to Europe, and all of a sudden, here comes Howard Thurman uh, writing from a perspective where the Christian view is not sequestered by the European view. And he gives an Africanity to the interpretation of Jesus that is bottom up, that he speaks to those who have their backs against the wall. And oppressed people really believe that a religion that doesn't work for you is useless. <laughs> well, Thurman would be in that camp also. Yet as Thurman anchored Jesus in the black experience, he also presented a challenging perspective as to who Jesus was. Dr. Thurman accepted the idea that Jesus did not want to be worshiped, that he wanted to be followed, he wanted to be believed. Howard Thurman believed that Everybody should emulate the historical Jesus. It's probably not an accident that black Americans talk more about Jesus. White Americans talk more about the Christ. One is abstract, one is very concrete. His focus on the human historical Jesus both got him in trouble because he didn't say enough about virgin birth and physical resurrection and miracles. He didn't. But what he said more than enough about is what it is to live an exemplary life of, of attending to that deep, constant connection with God. So if, if people have trouble with Howard Thurman's Christology, welcome to the long line of Christians who've had a lot of trouble with that. After Jesus and the Disinherited is published, a young Martin Luther King Jr. writes a term paper quoting Thurman verbatim with this story. <laughs> you're not slaves, you're not niggers, you're God's children. And this sense of the dignity and worth of the person is, is a fundamental theme for Thurman. Howard Thurman breaks yet another barrier when he's named Dean of Marsh Chapel at the predominantly white Boston University. The position affords him national visibility and a chance to expand what he began at fellowship. His major project was how do we bring three different religious traditions together here at BU? You have Jewish traditions located here, Catholic traditions, and Protestant. Life Magazine and Ebony named Thurman among the great preachers in America. He releases Meditations of the Heart that positions him in the forefront of contemplative spirituality. And he again takes weekly worship in a bold new direction with the introduction of theater, non-traditional music, and modern dance. All he believes will deepen the religious experience. Thurman experiences the arts as deepening his own religious experience. So it's not for Thurman just a speculative matter or theoretical matter regarding the arts. His personal experience of the arts is that they transcend that which divides us, but they also deepen the sense of the experience of God. And again, he incorporates silence into the weekly services. Some thought that Howard Thurman was almost a saint and other thought that he was something almost mystic about him. 
I think a lot of people just don't understand the power of silence. And he certainly is the one to encourage it with his meditations, how good it is to center down or in quietness and confidence. He felt like that each of us has our own particular connection with spirit or the spirit within. Listen to your own inner voice. The sound of the genuine, there is something within you, right, that, that uh, rest within you that only you have. But can you hear that unique sound? In Boston, Sue Bailey continues to make her own mark. This is a place where Sue Bailey Thurman just shined. She developed the international student program, developed scholarships for international students. When Thurman arrives at Boston University, a young Martin Luther King Jr is completing his doctoral work in theology. The two would get together informally, often to cheer their common hero, Jackie Robinson. King would visit uh, Dr. Thurman on a Sunday afternoon, and they would watch baseball and would talk. King was very interested in hearing Thurman in chapel services. He would be taking these voluminous notes on Thurman's preaching and felt that Thurman was saying things that were important. Over the next years, King is more and more in the front lines of a movement that would bring together a people and ultimately change a nation. But in 1958, all that nearly comes to a tragic end when the 29-year-old King is in Harlem signing copies of his book, Stride Toward Freedom, when a woman stabs him with a letter opener. Now, Dr. King would come sometime and tell the story after he was stabbed. The doctor said, it's good that you didn't sneeze. He said, if I had sneezed, I probably would have died. As King recovers, Thurman travels to Harlem Hospital to visit him, offering a different kind of advice. You have started a movement that has taken on a life of its own, and I would really strongly encourage you to take some time off um, and to spend some time in silence and in solitude and just you know, begin to listen for what is going to be your role in this movement. I think Howard Thurman is emphatically interested in the spiritual well-being of Martin Luther King Jr mainly because he senses, again, the tragic dimensions of this struggle and the danger that awaits one who dares to stand publicly and speak the truth to America. In one of those correspondences, King said to Thurman, I will continue to be thinking about your question to me, where do I go from here, which is also the title of the last published book of Martin Luther King Jr., Where Do We Go From Here? Probably one of the only extended periods of King being off the trail in terms of the civil rights movement followed Thurman's counsel regarding that matter. In a, the next few months, King is on his way to the land of India. But when he returns after February 1959, he is a fully devoted follower of nonviolent resistance. When Thurman retires from Boston University, he, Sue Bailey, and their two daughters leave for San Francisco to begin a new chapter of life. He launches a trust fund for needy black students and often guest lectures. Man in a three-piece suit sitting on a desk, absolutely delighted. Students know when you love them, and I think he loved his students, and it came right back at him. And during this time, they travel to the Middle East, where Thurman explores the ancient world, and to Africa, where he reconnects to his slave ancestry. He writes this most moving meditation on viewing the coast of Africa. Across these same waters, how many years ago they came, in the deep, heavy darkness of the foul-smelling hole of the ship, where they could not see the sky, nor hear the night noises, nor feel the warm compassion of the tribe, they held their breath against the agony. How does the human spirit accommodate itself to desolation? Back home, the nonviolent civil rights struggle 
is gaining ground, but it comes at a great cost. The quality of your movement will be defined by what you inject into the principles upon which you stand. And that's where I think a Howard Thurman is so critical. Then in the early evening of April 4th, 1968, the man who has been the face of nonviolent resistance meets his own violent fate. So around 10 minutes to six, we came out in the courtyard, he was coming out the door. He, he raised his head, pow! He hit him right here in seven this time. It was an eerie scene. Reverend Abernathy came out and said, get back, get back, this is my dearest friend. Martin, you can't leave us, we, 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 we need you now. Well, the irony is a man who embodied so much love was killed by hate. The past of nonviolence killed by violence. As the nation grieves and many take to the streets in rage, Thurman is invited to eulogize the man he helped guide into the nonviolence movement. Martin Luther King was the living epitome of a way of life that rejected physical violence as the lifestyle of a morally responsible people. He was able to put at the center of his own personal religious experience a searching ethical awareness. Thus, organized religion as we know it in our society found itself with its back against the wall. May we harness the energy of our bitterness and make it available to the unfinished work which Martin has left behind. The 1970s in San Francisco afforded the Thurmans more time for family and friends. When I was in high school, I, I was having a difficult time, and I had considered maybe moving to another school, and he said to me, very important to not let difficult people or difficult situations control you, and that this is something that you're gonna have the rest of your life, that you have to deal with the rest of your life. So that was a very kind of down-to-earth advice that has resonated with me my entire life. In my many conversations with him, there was no concentration on saving my soul or preparing me for the next life. We were dealing with what was in front of us. That life, which had been so rich and left a legacy for generations to come, ended April 10th 1981. Howard Thurman was 81 years old. I think he was one of the unacknowledged shapers of 20th century America and in shaping American religion. If you are a serious person about your own journey, especially if you are in the struggle for human rights, you've got to meet Howard Thurman. When I learned that as a young boy, an oak tree was his favorite conversation partner, he had me at hello. Thurman was very clear that if you do not have that sense of internal or interior commitment, then social change is always doomed to failure. I am eternally grateful that he was a friend of mine. Even now, I see his big grin and eyes piercing deeply, and he says, all social issues are temporary and brief. Go deep. Oh, 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 the idea that God is the God of the darkness and the light. This is the ground, it seems to me, of my own transcendent religious experience that gives to me courage, even in the presence 
are the most acute contradictions of life, and this is the basis of my hope. Enjoy that? Yeah. Very interesting. Interesting to see the background. Martin Luther King Jr. gets a lot of publicity, but uh, to see who inspired him and to see, you know, the Bible says all good things uh, come from God. And when you see people living peaceful, nonviolent lives like Christ and standing up for freedom, for rights, Uh, It's inspiring, so it's a good way to kick off. To remember in this country, you know, we don't do it to make everybody feel bad, but to remember where we've come from and to not repeat the mistakes of history. So next week we will be looking at uh, one of America's most prominent theologians and how he wrote on uh, social issues as well and politics, Reinhold Niebuhr. So it's another film by Martin Doblemeyer. So we'll, we'll show that next week right back here at 7 o'clock. Let's bow our heads for prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you. We thank you for inspiring Howard to, to stand up for freedom and justice. Lord, we know that you stand with the oppressed and those with their backs against the wall. May you be with us as we leave this place and protect us until we meet again. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.